All right, so we're today going to talk about the fact that God is love. And I hope you don't check out, because we're Christians, most of us in this room, and we've, we've heard that God loves us. We've heard that God is love. We've read it in Scripture. And so I think there might be a tendency when we're talking about God is love, it's like, oh, I know this. And I would just guess that there are some of us in this room that don't know it quite like we're going to talk about it today. Or perhaps we knew about it, but somehow we've forgotten it. And it's a very elementary, fundamental concept in Christianity, but I got to tell you that this message has challenged me. And I hope that it challenges you, but more importantly, I hope by by the power of God's Holy Spirit that you are transformed this morning. Not just because I'm up here speaking and it's a, you think it's a good message or not a good message or whatever, but it's just that the Holy Spirit would come into your heart and pour God's love into your heart and you were transformed by that. Lord, help us to refocus. Lord God, we want to Receive your love today. We want to be transformed by your love. Through your word, through the washing of your word, let us be transformed by who you are. In Jesus' name. God is love. And we find this in 1 John chapter 4, both in verse 18 and in verse 16. We're going to go all through this uh, in chapter 4 of 1 John, starting with verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because what? God is love. God is love. And we know that he's loving, and we know that for God so loved the world, past tense, but he, he is love. Like, I want us to understand the concept. It's not just something he does. It's not even just an attribute. He is love. God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So if you want to know what God how God showed his love, it's by him sending his son. And then he says it again, this is love. Okay, lean in. What's he going to say? What's the word going to say? This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, we know this, right? John three sixteen. you know, for God so loved the world. We know that God loves us. But do we really know it? Have we fully received it? Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. Listen, God lives in us and his love is made what? Complete in us, not partial Not just some, but his love can be made complete inside you. A completeness. And I believe that there are plenty of Christians out there that are feeling incomplete. That are not feeling loved. They're not feeling the love of God. There's a, there's a lack of completeness happening there. Verse 13, this is how we know, listen, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. I want you to tuck that away, put it on the side for a second, because that's going to really be impactful in just a, bit, just a little bit. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And we celebrate part of that during this season of Christmas, the, uh, Jesus coming to the earth. Verse 15, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And if God is love, you could almost say, 
Love lives in them, and they in love. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us, to rely on his love. Again, God is love. And whoever lives, excuse me, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us. You want to know how, how it's made complete? The Word of God is going to tell us. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now, what does that mean? I mean, it could mean a lot of things. We are called to be like Jesus. Christian actually means like Christ or little Christ. In this world, we are like Jesus. So when people see us, they need to see us just overflowing with love, knowing that we're loved and loving others. But I, what I love about this in this context, in this world, we are like Jesus. I believe this is also saying that when the Father sees us, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see all of our scars and our mistakes and our sins. But I believe there's a lot of Christians that are walking around wallowing in Fear and wallowing in guilt and wallowing in condemnation. But when God the Father sees us, he sees his Son. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's how we are who we are. That's how we become Christians is because of what Jesus has done for us. And so when the world sees us and when the Father sees us, in this world we are like Jesus. Verse 18 Listen, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. There are Christians that are afraid of hell still. There are Christians who think God is mad at them daily. There are Christians that are wallowing in fear, and it says perfect love drives out fear. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So if you have fear in your life about God's punishment or about God being mad at you, if you have fear in your life, you have to admit you, are, you have not been made perfect in love. There's still fear. You're still listening to the enemy's lies. You're still worried about your past. Like, what about my past? What about my past? You guys heard me share that a guy called me on the phone and it was a good-sized conversation. I could not convince him that he was redeemable. He thought no matter what, because of his past, he was damned to hell. There's no way he could be saved. And I tried to convince him. I tried to tell him anyone could be saved because of the love of God. And if you're a Christian, you got to hold your head up high. No, have the joy of the Lord. But I do believe that some of us have kept God's love out. We haven't fully received his love. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. The only way we even understand what love is is understanding the concept of him loving us first. Here's that verse again. I want you to tuck away for a second. Verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. So for the longest time, when I think of his spirit, I think of his power. I have to admit, I've been obsessed with his power. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, which is good. But what about his love? Romans 5.5. 5. Listen to this. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. My focus for too long, if I'm being honest, has been focusing on his power. But the real power is in his love. 
I want us to look at something here for a second. I want, when I think of in terms of God's love being poured out, I think of this. Let's just imagine that this is like a, like a piece of your heart. This is the, the area of your heart where you receive love, where God wants to pour his love into your heart. And so the Holy Spirit comes along, and he wants to pour God's love into your heart. And the beauty of that is, when that happens, we're able to give it back. We're able to love him back because we're full of his love. But oftentimes, for various reasons, we have a barrier around that area of our heart that keeps God's love from being poured into our heart. There's a barrier. It could be, you've heard me mention it before, our upbringing damaged us. There was neglect or abuse. Or even, perhaps you had the best upbringing in the world. I read this on Desiring God dot com or dot whatever. Desiring God's a great website that has great articles. Even if you had the best parents and the best upbringing, perhaps you're leaning too much on your good upbringing. Or maybe when you got older, people burned you, people hurt you, and so you, you, you created this barrier around your heart, and, and God's trying to pour out his spirit onto your heart, and like it, it doesn't get soaked into your heart. And you, you, try to, you, try to, you try to love others, you try to love God, and, and, and that area is still missing the love of God. And I want you to open your heart up to God today and allow him to pour his love into that area of your life so that you are full of and it's overflowing, and you're able to give back. You're able to love God because you're full. You're able to love others because you're full. And toss aside that barrier. Toss aside the walls that you maybe put up around your heart. Romans 5, 6. You see, at just the right time, we've been talking a lot about time lately, God's time. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's unconditional love. If he died for you and then you got saved, how much more does he love you now? Christ died for the ungodly. That is a beautiful picture of unconditional love. You were ungodly. You were a sinner. You were unlovable. He continues, jump to verse 8, but God demonstrates, he demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You need to receive his love. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells us the two greatest commandments are love God and love others, which is impossible to do without God's love. You could try. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love others. I'm going to try real hard. And you get frustrated and you fail. And then you think God's mad at you again and again and you're afraid. You're afraid because you have not been made perfect in love. When you have a hard time receiving his love, it's difficult to obey and to love. 1 John 5, 3. This is in the CSB. I believe it's the Christian Standard Bible. This is the version of the Bible that the Experiencing God book uses. And I hope that if you haven't got a copy yet, you can get a copy. We'd love to buy you a copy. If you can't afford one, jump in on the Bible study there. But it says this, for this is what love... This is what love for God is, to keep his commands, and his commands are not a burden. Do you hear what that says? This is what love for God is, to keep his commands, and his commands are not a burden. 
I've often read these types of verses like this. If I want to prove that I love God, I'm going to keep his commands. I need to perform for God in the way of obedience in order to receive his love. Or because I love him, I keep his commands. Do you see the difference? And he says it is not a burden. Jesus says my burden is easy and my yoke is light. It's not to be difficult because he's the one that empowers us to love. He's the one that empowers us with his love to obey him. Again, uh, in the CSB, this is John 14, 21. As a matter of fact, this is the unit four memory verse from Experiencing God, our Bible study. Jesus said this, The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Listen, do you love God and then obey Or do you obey in order to receive love from him? I want us to look at the, well, first of all, I want to look at 1 John 4.18 first. Again, fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I want you to ask yourself today, do you want to be made perfect in love today? Or at least start the journey Because here's the thing. I think a lot of people, when they get saved, they got saved out of fear. Like, I don't want to go to hell. And so they get saved. They receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But listen, that's how the relationship started. And for a lot of us, that's how it continues. It began with fear, and it continues with fear. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Listen, I think it's important for people to get saved no matter what. I mean, they're going to get saved out of fear, fine, get them saved. But I think they need to really, really understand God's love. It's important for us to understand God's love and to receive his love, knowing that it's unconditional. Let's look at 1 John 5, 3 and John 14, 15 in the NLT. Loving God means keeping his commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. I'm not sure how many of you read it the way I've read it. To where if I obey him, I'm, I'm performing for him, I'm proving my love, and then I'll receive his love. But we're supposed to be receiving his love, and then we just obey out of, out of the love relationship that we have for him. We want to obey him, and he empowers us through his love to obey him. So look at this. Two different ways of looking at God's love. I obey God to earn his love, or... I obey God because he loves me. Let that sit with you for a little bit. Which one are you? I obey God to earn his love. I do what he tells me to do. I abstain from things he tells me to abstain from because I'm trying to earn his love. Or I obey God because he loves me. Okay, here's the next one. Two different ways to love God. I obey God to show that I love him. I obey God because I love him. Which one are you? Do you obey God to show that you love him, to perform for him, or do you obey God because you love him? Here's something else. Two different reasons to obey God. Either do it out of duty or out of love. Duty, according to the dictionary, is a moral or legal obligation, a responsibility. Love is an intense feeling of deep affection. That's an okay definition. We'll look at 1 Corinthians 13 in just a little bit. But according to the dictionary, love is an intense feeling of deep affection. So which one are you? Do you do it out of duty or do you do it out of love? And here's a question I've been asking people. It's actually two questions. The first one is important, and then the second one is irrelevant if the first one isn't in the affirmative. First question. When push comes to shove, will you die for Jesus? 
Like if it became illegal to be a Christian in this country and the punishment was death, would you die for Jesus? Would you die for your faith? Just let that sit there for a second. Would you die for the gospel's sake, for Jesus? Here's the follow-up question. Again, if it's in the affirmative. Would you die for him out of duty or out of love? It's a pretty poignant, powerful question. I think if I was to answer that question, I think typically Chris Santos would do it out of duty. I would probably do it out of, out of duty. But wouldn't it be amazing if we were to give our lives to God through obedience, through sharing the gospel with others, through living for him and doing what he has called us to do, not out of duty, some sort of obligation or responsibility, but we would do it purely out of love because we have been so poured into that God has poured so much of his love into us that it's just frothing with his love and we're able to give it out we're able to give it back. You know, it reminds me of the Pharisees. This is just a little snippet of, of, of Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees. Luke eleven forty two. 42. Woe to you, Pharisees, he says, because you give, a, uh, give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs. So in other words, they're good on tithing. But you neglect justice and what? The love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So he's saying, hey, look, it's great. I'm glad you're tithing. Wonderful. But you're forgetting the most important thing, the love of God. And I always have compassion and empathy for the Pharisees because I think they were trying to get it right, at least at first. At first, they were trying to get it right. Just like a lot of us as Christians that have been walking with God for a long time, we're trying to get it right at first. But the, but the point is you can't get it right. <laughs> Without him, apart from him, we can do nothing. It's his love that empowers us to live out the life that he has called us to live out. So I've heard the question plenty of times, why did God give us free will? Why did he give us free will? Why didn't he just, just make us like obedient people? You know, like we just obey him no matter what. Well, that's not love. Love is when you choose. You receive love from him, and then you choose him. If we were just doing everything that he asked us to do or told us to do because we're programmed to do that, that sounds very much like a robot. <laughs> Here's some definitions of robot. Be honest with yourself and with God. Does this somewhat sound like your relationship with God. A machine resembling a human being and able to re replicate certain human movements and functions automatically. Here's some sub-definitions. A machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically, especially one programmable by a computer. Here's the one I really want to get at here. A person who behaves in a mechanical or unemotional manner. You're just going through the motions. You're just obeying God out of duty as opposed to out of love. And it's possible that part of the reason why is that you have this barrier around the area of your heart that's intended and designed to receive love from God. And God wants you to open your heart to him and receive his love. And I believe it has to be a supernatural thing. You can't force it. You can't take God's love and just cram it into your heart. And you can't do anything about it. You have to wait upon him and just say, God, I realize that I don't have my heart full of your love. I realize I've just been going through the motions. I, I realize I'm just doing things out of duty and responsibility and codependency or whatever, fill in the blank. Like I just, I just been kind of robotic. 
I get frustrated with people. I get frustrated with myself. And I, I, I constantly feel empty. I, you want me to love you and love others, but I'm just so empty. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. We have to remember that. That he first loved us with an unconditional love. Verse 18. There is no fear in love. None. There's no fear in love. But perfect love, perfect love drives out fear. You want to get rid of fear in your life? You want to get rid of that feeling that God is mad at you? You want to get rid of that, that fear of hell? I'm talking about Christians. Listen, if you're not a Christian, I believe that you should be Draw near to God, and he's going to draw near to you. If you're not a Christian, I believe that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive God's love so that he can empower you to love him back and and love others. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Listen to that line. Fear has to do with punishment. I'm afraid God's going to be mad at me. Like, how often do you try to make decisions? I don't know if I should go right or go left. If if I choose left and it's wrong, then God's going to be mad. If I choose right and it's wrong, God's going to be mad. I'm always, I'm just always afraid. Oh, man, I I messed up again. I sinned again. God's got to be mad at me by now. Maybe it's just one too many sins and I'm getting kicked out. And, and, and the devil is just having a field day. He's just having a good old time knowing that he could keep Christians suppressed with fear and, and hardening their hearts. And just, just There's just too many Christians that are just wallowing in, in this lack of love and not sure about the relationship with God. And it's just God wants to deliver you and he wants to fill you with his love. Romans 5, 5 again, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Again, two different reasons to obey God. Do you do it out of duty, or do you do it out of love? And here's the thing. I I think it's wonderful if we obey God no matter what. Like, if you're going to obey God out of duty, then, then praise God. But how much better and how much freeing would it be if you're doing it out of love? I obey you because I love you. And when I mess up, I know that you love me and I can repent and ask for forgiveness and, and the, the, the relationship continues. Fear is the antithesis of love. And if you have fear in your life, anxiety, then your love meter is off. You're, 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 you're more dry than you are full of God's love. If, 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 if you're... If you're experiencing fear that you don't have enough of God's love in you. And it's not a works-based thing. Again, you can't shove God's love in your heart. Just allow God to tear down the barriers. Yeah, but God, my, my dad, he, he was mean to me. I know, but I'm not mean. I love you. You, you know, my mom, she neglected me. I won't neglect you. You know that guy I dated for years or, or that girl that ran out on me or whatever it is, they hurt me. I, I'm not going to hurt you. You just let the barriers come down. You let the walls come down. You, you, you let God expose that area of your life. It's okay to let him hold your heart in his hand. He's going to fill it with his love. And first and foremost, you're going to feel loved. And as you feel loved, you're going to express that love back to him and you're going to express that love to other people because he wants us to love him and love others. What does that look like? We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I don't know if you guys remember the spirit-filled sandwich that I talked about. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the, the gifts of the Spirit, like, like the power of God. And then chapter 14 talks about the gifts of the Spirit, the power of God. And it's the, the bread of the sandwich. But right in the middle, he talks about love. And he says, you can walk in power with God. You can do these amazing things for God. You can go out and just do this 
awesome stuff for God, but if you have not love, you're nothing. Matter of fact, you're a clanging gong and a clashing cymbal if you have not love. It doesn't start with his power. It starts with his love. What does it look like? Love is patient. <laughs> Traffic, Starbucks line, you know what I'm saying? Love is patient. Love is kind. Oh, I, I wish they'd get theirs, you know what I'm saying? It does not envy. You're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. It does not boast. It is not proud. There's a humility. When you are full of love, there's a humility that comes. You don't need to boast. You don't need to prove yourself to anybody because you're loved by your heavenly Father. It does not dishonor others. Love is honoring. It honors others. It's a beautiful thing. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Man, there's so many people that are just angry today. They're just ticked off constantly. Why? Again, fear is the antithesis of love. If you have fear, it's hard to be patient because you don't, you, don't you don't know what to... You're, you're trying to control your situation. You try to get there fast. You, you, if you have fear, you're not going to be kind. You're going to be envying because you're not content. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I remember what you did last year. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Listen, if God is love, God always protects. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. Love never fails. This is a quote right out of a Experiencing God the book that we're going through in our Wednesday Bible study, it says this, when you come to know God by experience, you will be convinced of his love. When you are assured of his love, you can believe him and trust him. And when you trust him, you will obey him. Another quote from the book is something like this. If you have an obedience problem, you actually have a love problem. If you have a hard time obeying God, it's because you have a, a love problem. Perhaps you have a love deficit. In closing, I want to show you Ephesians chapter, th chapter 3. Excuse me. I pray, this is Paul writing, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. A couple of things I want to point out here back in verse 17. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, it's important that as Christians that we are rooted and established in his love. That's the foundation. That's the starting point. For God so loved you. Not that he just loved you. He is love. And he wants to fill your heart with his love. But then at the closing of verse 19, it says that you may be filled. You may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Not just some of it, but all of it. That you walk around with your head up high if you're a Christian, having the joy of the Lord, having the love of the Lord, saying, if the devil comes along and says, you're a loser, say, uh-uh, I'm a child of God. 
You're the loser. You get it in the end. You know what I'm saying? Or you could say, yeah, I was a loser, but now I'm victorious in Christ. Why? Because my Father in heaven loves me. Listen, I want to, this keeps coming up in my mind, and I just want to bring it up here. Something my wife sent me off of uh, the internets. Um, if I could find it here. Oh, no. Where did it go? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here it is. So there's, there's two columns. There's God's voice and there's Satan's voice. God's voice calms. Satan's voice obsesses. God's voice comforts. Satan's voice worries. God's voice convicts. Satan's voice condemns. God's voice encourages. Satan's voice discourages. God's voice enlightens. Satan's voice confuses. God's voice leads. Satan's voice pushes. God's voice reassures. Satan's voice frightens. God's voice stills. Satan's voice rushes. And my wife is certain, I haven't proved her wrong, but she claims that Jesus was never in a hurry. And we should not be in a hurry in this moment. I believe that it's very, very possible and very likely that this word has impacted some of y'all. You know, it's hard for me as, as a, someone who's been walking with the Lord for over three decades, I, I feel like this message has schooled me, and I'm on a journey of receiving God's love in a way that I've never received it before. So I want to open up this altar to everyone. There's nothing magical about this altar. You can respond to God in your closet if you want. But there's something special about coming to the altar in the presence of other believers in the house of God. And today I would just ask you to ask your Father in heaven to soften your heart and just have his spirit pour love into your heart and he would teach you to receive his love it's one thing to know about his love it's one thing to have received it years ago even but today I believe your father in heaven wants to love on you in a way that only he can would you come to the altar and just ask him to fill you. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. While we were still sinners, you loved us. While we were enemies of God, you loved us. How much more those of us who have accepted you as Lord and Savior, those of us who are saved, how much more do you love us now, Lord God? Help us not to ever listen to the enemy's lies. The enemy is a liar and a thief. He wants us to, to, to be wallowing in fear, and I rebuke fear in the name of Jesus. I rebuke fear in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that the voice we listen to would be the voice of our Heavenly Father who says, I love you, I love you, I love you with an unconditional love. I know you messed up. Go ahead. Repent, and I'll forgive you of your sins. I have washed you clean. I have made you righteous. On this world, you are like Jesus. I, when I see you, I see my son. Perfection. 
I just pray, God, that we would grow in your love, that you would just continue to fill us with your love, that by your Spirit you would pour out your love into our hearts, and we would let you in. The walls would be torn down. The, 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 the hardness would be broken up, oh God, that you would soften our hearts and fill us with your love, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we would walk around with our heads up high, not boastful, not proud, but humble, knowing that you love us, knowing that our Father in heaven loves us. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We have a request. God loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Oh. Now go love on each other. Go show that love that God has given you. Give it back to other people in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. God bless you.